The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you The Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Salbretti, Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. Join Martin as he conducts regular Q&A sessions on topics of interest to Christians serious about their faith. These Q&A sessions will continue to cover an ever-widening range of topics, all with an eye to honoring the command to let all things be done unto edification. Welcome. We are here live with Chalcedon Q&A and a little meat of the word. I'm Martin Sabretti. I'm the Vice President of the Chalcedon Foundation. And we take these questions at this point in time. I see that Mark Rushtuni is going a little long with his message, so there'll be a little overlap, but I don't think it's going to hurt anything. So let's go ahead and get started. We have uh, five questions that came in online, which we'll take. I'm going to adjust the um, order just slightly. Also, I had one question come in that I'm going to send a private me uh, message, a private reply back to because of the nature of the question. So I'm going to start with this question first. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, it states, We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Does this mean that experience is the direct result of patiently standing through tribulations? And this sounds a lot like a question we had before, but I wanted to examine it again uh, because there's several issues come up. First off, I'd like to point out when he says, we glory in tribulations, that actually is better rendered, we boast in them. There's a certain kind of boasting, like for Jewish privilege, that Paul says is excluded. But when you boast based on God's promise, that is acceptable. And so he's boasting uh, in this particular case, in this passage of Romans that we boast in the tribulations. And it's not tribulations um, just by itself. It's got the article in front of it, the tribulation, the sufferings that are common to all Christians, the well-known troubles, the well-known sufferings that we go through. Uh, so that's important. Now this notion of the, the here we have an interesting situation where, as Dr. Rashtuni said, there's a reason why the word translator is from the root word traitor, because we tend to be uh, unfaithful to the meaning of the text. And so to here, we find that the King James translation gives a different sense than the original uh, Greek words. And uh, we do get the original Greek sense in places like uh, Young's literal translation, among others. So this word uh, hippomonon, which uh, is translated patience, is not just merely a passive quality here. Uh, as uh, Hans Headley and Sandham, Sandham say, uh, it's... Uh, masculine constancy in holding out under trials, or better yet, fortitude. Fortitude. Uh, Lenski quotes Trench to the effect that this is a noble word that always suggests manliness, brave patience, which we call perseverance, which remains under the load, remains under the load of affliction without faltering or complaint, and goes right on no matter what the load may become. In other words, brave manly courage. And the idea is repeated also in Second uh, Timothy 2.3, where Paul says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Uh, another important point is that the word there that we translate um, experience is really better is, uh, in the sense of tried, to try something like that, try a metal and test it. Tried quality versus untested quality. So it tempers something. It's like the difference between a tempered uh, veteran soldier versus the new recruit. So that's the sense in which it's done. So uh, it's like endurance produces character is one way to translate these texts, uh, which is closer to the case. And one other point here is that these ideas are actually reversed in the book of James in the first chapter. In James 1, 3, he uh, puts uh, the order different. Now, why does the order appear one way in Paul and a different way in James? Well, the fact of the matter is all these things are working together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So it's not as if they are necessarily cause and effect, but that they are uh, juxtaposed. They come together in the way that they form Christian character, uh, tested, tried character. So that's the essence there. 
another important point when it says, when it finishes off saying, you know, that we're not ashamed, it literally is we're not put in terror. Uh, we can sustain ourselves through the trials that are coming. But these are the trials that are common to all Christians. So I think that should settle that question once and for all. In this case, the translation gives a little bit different sense in the King James than what the Greek says. And I hope we kind of opened that up a bit better today. Some people claim that when they are opposed in the life or work, in their life or work, that it is the result of the devil's work. Is this a presumptuous perspective? And can the devil or demons go any further than God allows? A la Job. Uh, as Dr. Rushdie would always say, the devil is not omnipresent like the Lord is. He can only be at one place at one time. So if the devil is spending a lot of time on you, he doesn't have a lot of time to spend on the other six or so billion people in the world. Uh, you must be very important to the devil that uh, he has that time just eked out for you. Now, demons, well, that's another uh, notion, of course. But the idea that we are opposed in them, uh, uh, of course there's going to be opposition to the building of the kingdom of God. There's always going to be a Tobias and a Sanballat. Uh, and most of the time the opposition is actually internal to us. We are the biggest barrier uh, to the uh, proposition. That's why reconstruction begins with us. It doesn't begin with casting out the demon, uh, alleged demon. Uh, there's plenty of sin in us that has to be overcome for the kingdom of God to move forward faithfully. And so that's why God calls us to faithfulness. And uh, James lays this out so very clearly. Just resist the devil and he flees from you. Luther, as the uh, story go, goes, saw the devil or someone he thought was the devil and he threw an inkwell at him. Uh, he trusted in this notion that James taught that, you know, resist in him and he flees. He's a very, very weak enemy if you simply resist rather than being enticed by him and his appeal. Because he offers all sorts of things, including rest from the Lord's work <laughs> that we desperately need to be about uh, as opposed to uh, resting. But think about this. They were resting from the Lord's work in Haggai's day and then the they weren't finishing the Lord's temple. They were seeing to their own comfort, building their own houses. And the timber foundation was rotting out there. And God finally says, I've had enough of that. You're seeing after yourself, but not building up my house. And so God takes steps to correct Israel's um, fat sitting on its lees attitude. So uh, I don't believe this is a result of the devil's work per se, except in the general sense that the devil is a destroyer and his job is to derail the work of God and our job is to keep it on the rails uh, and uh, to do so prayerfully with the Lord's Spirit driving on that process so that it is not us in our own strength. Of course, if you're operating in your own strength, then the devil is very, very happy to have that situation because then your main source of power is detached and clipped away from you and uh, without that, uh, you're fair game for the devil. Uh, he is the uh, the king of the power of the uh, the. And in other words, he's, uh, the realm of ethical disobedience is his proper domain, and he has a legitimate claim to everyone who defies God, because now you just put yourself in his corner and are his lawful prey, in effect. And so what Christ has done is to extract us out. There's an extraction of the victims and hostages from the domain of the devil, because Christ can was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. This is very, very clear. And we are to walk with Christ in this process to become, in effect, um, ministers of reconciliation and uh, bold with respect to the gospel, tearing down all strongholds, including the devil's strongholds, that are opposed to the knowledge of Christ, using spiritual weapons, not worldly weapons. Question three, where should someone draw the line in terms of another exercising their Christian liberty, and Christian liberties in quotes? Uh, are there clear-cut rules? This is an area of wisdom, after all, Paul makes the comment that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. And therefore, uh, we must, must pre uh, prefer others before ourselves in our approach. Uh, Dr. Rushdoni, when he spoke uh, uh, on the Book of Romans and did a large lecture series on it, the audio sermons are outstanding, he goes into some depth on the notion of the strong in the faith versus the weak in the faith. And the interesting thing is that he condemns the strong in the faith for the same reason that Paul does. He says this is not a positive label to wear that we're strong in the faith because the strong in the faith were doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing. Uh, and they weren't, uh, and so they use this as an excuse for doing things that were harmful to others. And this was not the attitude of any Christian. Uh, and so Dr. Rashtuni magnifies this. Better to be weak in faith but then relying on God and to uh, be operated in terms, operate in terms of the love of God for you uh, and the love of neighbor 
as yourself, right? And so under that context, Christian liberty has its restrictions. Uh, but wisdom dictates this. It's not as if there's a cut and dried thing. That's why we have these wonderful examples in the Old Testament, uh, or our New Testament for that matter. There's a few in the Old. But in the, uh, the New Testament where uh, we discuss the idea of uh, in Romans 14 comes up, 1 Corinthians 8, how to deal with uh, a brother in a certain situation. And always Paul does not use his liberty as a, a pretense or an excuse to harm someone else's faith. And this ties back to what Christ himself uh, does. In Isaiah 42, it says he a bruised, uh, or a smoking flax he will not quench, a bruised reed he will not break. In other words, those who are injured or hurt, he is very gentle with them. He doesn't do anything to suddenly harm them any further than they've already been harmed. And so that should be our attitude too. The church is the only army that shoots its own wounded, as they say, and until that stops, we're going to be decimating our own numbers and uh, we'll be uh, snatching uh, defeat from the jaws of victory, as they say. <laughs> okay, so this next one is very interesting. This indicates why we need to continue to build. Uh, and I do see the questions coming up live. We'll go scroll back to them once I finish these. Uh, just as our pattern, we take the ones that came in in advance and then roll it back around to the live ones and get caught up, usually by... Uh, into the hour. Uh, and the thing I want to say about this question in advance is that it indicates that we have a lot of work to do as theonomists. Are there principles in God's law that teach us how to handle a person making verbal threats of physical violence? If they haven't actually acted on their words in any way, what kind of action can be righteously taken against them to protect those who may be in danger? So uh, this is interesting because in humanistic law they've had to develop this entire concept, certainly in America, of the so-called criminal threat. And one of the elements of the criminal threat is the question of intent. And this now gets us into the thought crime area. We have to determine the intent uh, behind the thing as opposed necessarily to the effect of it on the victim of it. It's also called terroristic um, threats in the same notion. And the idea is to uh, uh, create in the recipient a sense of imminent bodily harm, that they're going to be harmed or their family members are going to be harmed or some other threat is laid against them. So under um, civil law, humanistic law, we have to say, uh, they then bring in, unfortunately, the notion of the, the thought crime. Uh, and they also punish not only with probation, but also with jail time, which isn't biblical either. So we see that they've tried to work with this situation to try to uh, regulate this kind of conduct, but they realize it's a regulation of this free speech, and they can't absolutize free speech, saying you can say anything you want to anybody, because uh, evidently under humanistic law you cannot. They've started to draw these kind of lines, and the threat is one of these areas where the um, penalties are in, uh, designed to induce the threatener to cease and desist. Of course, he may still uh, uh, do so if he decides the, he prefer to do that and continue to pay the price. So what do you do about that at that point? It's interesting to me as uh, just uh, moving through a few areas to see that the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin attempted to um, condemn Christ for bringing a, thurble, a, a verbal threat against the temple. This is in Mark 14, 58, where he says, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will raise up another one made without hands. So in effect, they say this was a threat against the temple. However, because the witnesses could not agree on the exact wording, uh, they weren't able to nail him on it, but they were attempting to get him uh, uh, based on a verbal threat against the temple, which they're probably going to render as a blasphemy, as an attack against God himself. That was probably how that was going to be shaping. So obviously there's a sense in which a verbal threat can be taken seriously in Scripture. Uh, but the notion that we can bring mind reading in and things like this, uh, I think we need to focus on the result or the effect of the threat. And here I think where, uh, and I'm just using these terms in think of verses what Scripture saith for the following reason. We haven't uh, developed the general equity all the way through. So I, my suggestion is that theonomists do need to work all this stuff through. We have better ideas, of course, where it's clear, and the Bible says if this happens, uh, this concrete action happens, then these things are to occur for justice to arise. So what should be the case where the threat of something happening arises? Now it's in, in it's potential, it's not actual. Uh, and it's expressed in such a way that there could be an effect on the person who receives the threat. 
Uh, one possibility, I'm not putting out this out there as uh, ex cathedra, uh, apodictic statement, meaning this is the one for all. This is simply thinking out loud with my brethren here uh, on the Q&A session. Perhaps the anonymous need to think in terms of restitution. For example, if someone threatens me, then I say, in that case, uh, since I have witnesses to the threat, I am going to go take steps to protect myself, if it means a body service or a security system uh, or what have you, and I'm going to have the civil magistrate charge the threatener with the cost of my protection uh, uh, for a reasonable period of time, say. Uh, and if the threats escalate at that point, then, of course, then the civil magistrate says, looks like we need to uh, make this even more severe. Uh, and because now the individual is out the time and the uh, and the resources and the, and the opportunity cost because now he's spending money for a security he didn't need until the threat suddenly arose. And the threat was being originating with one individual or say an institution, whatever it might be. By that point, uh, we now bring at least the biblical principle of restitution into play. Um, you've, I've taken this as a credible threat and therefore I have placed uh, um, an effect on that. Now here is where humanistic law is going to come in and say, well, you're trying to mind read the, uh, the victim and say that it's a reasonable thing for them to go ahead and acquire a security protection, a bodyguard, whoever it was that they might need. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm saying at least here we're moving the thing from the mind reading area actually to something concrete. If it can be established that the... Uh, remember, biblical law is always designed to restitution itself even, in fact, to equalize things and restore community. So this becomes a basis under which Threatener realizes this is a bad situation. I need to rethink this. I don't think I can afford to be issuing, uh, breathing out threats. Uh, the Bible is full of threats, by the way. Saul was breathing out threats against David. Uh, and so uh, it, it, in the New Testament speaks about the threatenings. You know, the, uh, the disciples were threatened by the Sanhedrin um, to, to try to compel them to stop preaching the gospel even. Uh, but, of course, the position there was they didn't take the threat seriously. We had to obey God rather than man. So the, they were willing to receive beatings and stuff for the sake of the gospel, to suffer for the gospel's sake. However, in the modern world, we're talking about you just want to live at peace and someone decides that they're going to take away your peace. Then at that point, perhaps under theory of restitution, Theonymous could develop the biblical principles to say what ought to happen, therefore, is that the affected person goes to the civil magistrate, and makes the case that they require protection, and they require the protection, and a civil magistrate then uh, compels restitution for that protection from the threatener until the threatener's threat is uh, no longer being issued to them. There might be time frames and things like this that would be appropriate. But nonetheless, uh, we have several different ways to deal with that kind of thing. You know, if there's, a, uh, there's a third option in Scripture between rest, well, between the restitution and the capital crime. I'm not going to discuss that at the moment, but it may be that it comes into play. Um, but we will, that will be leave that for another time. Right now, I like to, I'm just pointing out that the anonymous, we're just now coming away from, you know, got a couple hundred years of setting the law of God aside and letting it rot. And now that we're starting to take it more seriously and actually talk actively about how to apply it, now you see we have homework to do. We theonomists need to then take these kind of questions, this one came from Erika Schanzenbach, uh, and, and take it seriously and say, how do we uh, work this in a theonomic society? And it might be that one group of theonomists see it one way, and another group of theonomists might see it in a different way. Then they need to get together and work those details out so that we can at least say, what is justice under this situation? Is it just that someone would be uh, deprived of their peace and uh, have to protect themselves at their own expense because of someone else deciding, I'm going to threaten you? Uh, and the answer uh, under biblical law is that there should be no such thing. Justice requires that these accounts be leveled in one way that restitution could be achieved that until such time as there's an actual concrete acting on a threat, in which case it might be a capital crime at that point. Nonetheless, you would think that it would be mitigated if a bodyguard is present. Anyway, no perfect solutions in a sinful world. That's kind of the point here, isn't it? Uh, this actually ties back to our very first question when uh, Lenski uh, commented, how is it that we're going to perfect character, get tempered, tried character, right, um, in that word experience, which is a bad translation in, 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 from one point of view. How do we acquire that? Unfortunately, he said, in a sinful world, the only way to acquire it is through sufferings and tribulations. So that is how character is developed. Prosperity does not develop character. It harms it. Uh, be, well, and more like this, you need to develop character so that you can handle prosperity. 
that's where we would uh, take uh, Erica's question at this point in time, that it is under continual study and theonomists need to work at it. It might be that uh, 10, 20 years down the line, they'll say the correct answer to this question is this, and Mr. Sorbetti was all wet. But Mr. Sorbetti did point out that we needed to work on the question and get it pinned down and gave us an, a sketch of where he thought it might go. If I'm right, then we'll find that out. And if, we're not, if I'm not right, I'm glad that someone corrected me. It's that simple. The fifth and final one that uh, came in was actually the very first question that came in, but it was long and involved. I didn't want to put it up front because it would tend to <laughs> uh, get away from us, and I'd end up spending some time on something that would glaze over eyes because uh, it's a long question. In fact, it's almost not quite a question as much as a statement. I gained much from your argument, which would be the rejection of a final apostasy, referring to the notion of does history end with a final apostasy or not. And I follow uh, Warfield and later Rush Dooney and Bet later B Bettner and uh, Dr. N Nigel Lee and other postmillennial scholars that the world would be completely converted to the last man standing. There would be no uh, sudden decline in the state of the church at the end of history. Uh, <clears throat> so that would be there's no final apostasy. There's, history does not end with this war uh, described in Revelation 27 verse 9. That actually is a complete misunderstanding of that passage. Uh, we are safe to say that nations shall not uh, lift up sword against the nation, neither shall they learn war evermore, and agree with Isaiah 2, 4 in its fullness, literally. So he says, I like the argument, I gain much from it. It presents a much more consistent, free-flowing post-millennialism, which is what Bettner said. He says, without it, post-millennialism has no capstone. Or as Rushton, said, if you tack on the final apostasy to post-millennialism, it's an amillennial hangover, which comes into the point of this question. I wonder if it would be strange, from your point of view, if I made the argument that amillennialism would be better off as well if your argument was integrated or attached to it, in other words, rejection of a final apostasy. Think of one of the graphs you saw in math class, consistent, equally proportioned curves going up and down. If a final apostasy were to be accepted, an immediate sharp diagonal can represent this. It would threaten the up-down, up-down motion so often described in amillennialism. In other words, the up-down, up-down motion of amillennialism, which is is merely temporary, I mean, it means like a sine wave in thinking, it is one of the more regular ones. In the end, the conclusion capstone is all about the sharp decline or final apostasy, and this final apostasy would happen within a single day or less. So as I'm arguing that the belief in a final apostasy would be more suitable and natural for dispensational premillennialism and historic premillennialism, who believe the kingdom and millennium come about after Christ's return, while a final apostasy would be bizarre for the one or same day people, amillennialists and postmillennialists. Well, the first thing I have to say is that whatever else would be depicted in Revelation 20, verse 7 to 9, the idea that that happens in a single 24-hour day is not likely because uh, it says the, uh, uh, the armies you know, marched over the breadth of the earth uh, to encompass the camp of the saints uh, to attack and destroy it. And mustering such an army and, and pulling it together in less than 24 hours uh, is not terribly likely. Um, the time frame doesn't fit, among other things. Also, this is interesting when he talks about perhaps it being more natural for amillennialism. The plain fact of the matter is, is that a lot of people believe Warfield was amillennial. Why? Because he didn't use Revelation 20 um, to defend the notion that the Great Commission would be fulfilled. That would be absolutely successful to the last man standing. He saw this depicted in Romans 11. He saw it depicted in um, 1 Corinthians 15, in 2 uh, Corinthians uh, 5. Other passages, John 129 for that matter, plenty of other places where he believes that it was taught with clarity uh, in Scripture. Also, for that matter, Matthew 518, he says, predicts the um, conversion of the entire world to the last man standing uh, when taken in its literal sense. So that's why John Valverde, one of the more famous dispensational premillennialists, who uh, shared systematic theology, I imagine, at uh, Dallas after Lewis Sperry Schaefer. In his book on prophecy, he actually describes and calls Warfield an amillennialist, which sounds wrong to us because, wait a minute, he believes in the gospel being, but because he denied that the millennium was a period of time on the earth. He saw it as the picture of the intermediate state in the heavens. And uh, consequently, Warfield also said the little season in, uh, of where the fire rains down and destroys the wicked is happening now. It's basically the difference between time on earth, time in heaven. Time on heaven depicted by the thousand years. Our time on earth is depicted as a little season during which God's, uh, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. So 
Uh, he has an interesting idea. I do believe some amelianus, known as optimistic amelianus, uh, are likely to be inclined toward Warfield's position. So they would not be arguing from Augustine's point, approach to the 20th uh, chapter of Revelation. Uh, they would agree more with Warfield's approach. Uh, and uh, in fact, interestingly enough, uh, one could argue that one of the people who proposed this theory of Warfield's earlier before him, which was William Milligan, he was not post-millennial in the sense he did not necessarily believe in um, a complete conversion of the world like Warfield did, but he did believe that the uh, little season of heaven was not an end-time thing. He says, no, 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 that's, that's the period of time during which we've been living for the last 20 centuries on the, on the earth, 20 centuries running since Christ ascended, we are in the little season of Satan, and God's fire is pouring down from heaven against it, and the enemies of God are being destroyed over time um, by the wrath of God, as talked about. So it is possible for it to be compatible with Amelianus like William Milligan. Uh, presumably even Easter Dick and Cleforth would be in that category. They wouldn't necessarily be um, big on the Great Commission being fulfilled. So I think that should about cover that particular question. But it's an interesting point to be raised. Again, problems are at the, any such final apostasy, one conflicts with everything the New Old Testament says about the victory of Christ being total and complete to the last man standing. And it's interesting when Warfield gets to this in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, and that kind of victory has to be over his spiritual enemies. That is, everything is opposed to the rule of God in our hearts. So that's an interesting way to take it. So let's see what our first question is. Right, good. Josh asks, Martin, do you believe America is headed toward and will experience an economic collapse because of covenantal violations? If so, what are some practical steps a family could take to prepare, prepare for that? Whether you're heading for that collapse or not, there are practical steps that every Christian family should take. Um, one being debt-free, eradicating debt. Two, uh, do not trust in, in Federal Reserve notes. These things are termed abominations in Scripture. The American dollar is a fluctuating weight of balance, the diverse weight of measure. You're not to have it on your person. Proverbs 11.1 1 says it, and it says it repeatedly in the law of God. Uh, if you have them on your person, it means you're going to use it. You're going to use something that essentially is designed to uh, shift value from one person to the other, from the debtor to the creditor, um, because the, it is the vehicle by which the value of the dollar is being destroyed uh, through monetizing debt and through printing more things up, even though they're not necessarily printing it anymore. They don't have to with uh, digits. Uh, so the option is here is then to start moving some of our resources, our reserves, into gold and silver, as a more reliable thing. And Dr. Rashtuni, of course, was advocating this is in the early uh, 80s when I first encountered him. He was big on that concept. And so an ounce, uh, he would say this, that a uh, so many, what, 30 pieces of, um, 30 gold pieces, 30 ounces of gold, would buy a car in the 1925, say. And he says, and today they'd be to buy the same kind of car, except a modern car. Uh, of, of similar value uh, uh, compared to that period of time. He says, in other words, the gold has kept, in essence, its, its purchasing power, whereas the paper dollars do not, because the gold is always an ounce of gold unless it's debauched, unless it's impure, unless it's actually coated lead or something like that to fool you, which is why it's important that assays, testing of the validity of the uh, gold and silver is important, which the scripture talks about this all the time. So uh, the upshot is families need to do these things, but basically being out of debt and also having the reserves in this area are important. Also, another important reserve that you have is your own fingers to get well. You know, the scriptures say, you know, the Lord, bless the Lord who strengthens my fingers to get wealth, also to fight war, but also the same concept. So you have resources, mental and uh, intellectual resources, which might have something to say in terms of uh, value for um, hard times. I recall when Dr. Gary North was uh, was more into survivalism than Dr. Rushdie by far, but he had a few interesting points to say. If there was such a massive collapse as was envisioned under certain scenarios, he said certain things would be very useful to have. He mentioned just a couple offhand. One of them was light bulbs, uh, that they would serve as money ultimately, because when light people's lights went out and there was no one producing light bulbs, then perhaps having them. So you had to have an eye for that. But the idea of using gold and silver allows us to at least have a medium of exchange so that we don't have to barter necessarily. We have medium of exchange that at least people will say, oh, that does look like a, a tenth of an ounce gold piece, and I imagine that's worth 
this much grain or something like that. We pray to God that we don't suffer from these things, but we and God up until this time has withheld the judgment, but then again, it is a sort of Damocles hanging over our head, and we full well deserve to have it fall upon us. Uh, God is long-suffering with us, and uh, that is an interesting point to bear. Uh, there's a difference between uh, God's suffering uh, uh, through our actions, which is ascribed, like say, in Romans 9, 22, 23. It's a very different word than the word used for um, patience that we talked about in Romans 5. When, when it's described of God, you know, being patient and long-suffering, uh, macrothemia, that's a whole different word when applied to God than, than us. So, uh, he, of course, because he's God, uh, it's something different going on there in, in his internal counsels. But the option is, uh, yeah, we, and then we need to then, of course, work at the local level to make sure that, uh, best that we can, that our local group is, uh, our local governments are not so inclined to be off in left field covenantally with God. Uh, perhaps God will create an enclave of hope in certain areas. I know areas throughout various states where we see such places where those um, counties say, and there's a lot of uh, merit to what uh, Dr. Joel McDermott says about reconstructing or rebuilding America one county at a time. Uh, there's a unit by which you can have influence and biblical value can uh, become coin of the realm, if you will, literally, uh, and people think and act in terms of what God requires. And so there might be a safe harbor there, which might not be the case elsewhere. So don't think in terms of the large federal picture at this point. Think in terms of local. Uh, there's ba value to that approach that Dr. McDermott uh, promotes in that interesting book of his. Hey, Bill Evans from Lebanon, Lebanon Missouri, on route to Los Angeles, my birthplace. Yes. Now, interestingly enough, I saw Ground Control put up uh, the discussion by Dr. Rush Dooney on Romans, which is excellent for the discussion of um, the strong versus the weak in the faith. He doesn't spend but one short paragraph on the passage that was the question came in, so uh, he just went past that because he, he thought it was self-explanatory. But he does get into more detail in those things in his commentary on James, first chapter, um, verses 3 and 12. Okay, David Collins has a question. My wife and I are trying to decide whether we should have another child. What's your advice considering that issue? Well, part of it asks the question is, so you have another child. So if you have a singleton now, there's every reason to want to have uh, another because now you have a family where there's interaction between the children. Uh, I think there's potential benefits. Uh, and now I'm talking, remember when Paul says now, not the Lord, but I say the same thing. I'm not saying scripturally. I'm saying there's benefit in uh, a family where there are siblings. Uh, because they can experience something that would be denied to a lot of other people, is a, a brotherly love or sisterly love or love for brother or sister, protection, a sense of a protection, so that things can be modeled from under the other, and that can have a powerful secondary effect, and you can increase the joy in the family. So there's plenty of things that would uh, dictate that. Um, the other factors uh, could be very, very different. What I don't think we should operate in terms of is fear. If we're going to make decisions based on fearfulness, I think we're in the wrong business. We should make our decisions based on the sense of victory and where we are and where our personal uh, journey toward being part of Christ's victory takes us. So uh, if I can be of any further assistance on that question, uh, you feel free to private message me, but I think that should suffice for the omen because if you're asking a general question, I can only give a general answer to it. Okay, let's see, another question from David. I understand it's between us and also a contextual decision, but are there principles you would consider valid reasons versus invalid reasons? I think I, I didn't even see that yet, and I gave an invalid reason. Fearfulness would be not a good reason to take, to worry about that. A lot of people say, well, I don't want to bring a child into this world. Um, but it's the only world there is, and it's the world that God, see, here, where's my Bible? Get me excited here about this text. See, in um, Psalm 22, Psalm 22, this has got really thin paper in it. So a short little slap of the Bible and it moves way too far. Okay, here it is. Right, they shall come and shall declare his right, the very last verse, they shall come. This is talking about the whole point of being a post right? 
All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto the Lord. This is verse 27. And all the kindreds, all the families of the nations shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that, that be fed upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. None shall keep alive his own soul. The seed shall serve him and shall be counted to the Lord for a generation. They that shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. So we need to have that generation yet to come. Uh, 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 people not yet born, that the Lord has done this. And by the way, this, the Lord has done this is an interesting verse. Not only is, uh, the way that he closes out, not just the things about all the ends of the earth coming and worshiping before God. Every single human being is the end game here. All the ends of the earth will worship. There's no exceptions to this. All the families of the nations shall worship before him. He shall be the governor among all the nations. And, uh, and it says, and we shall uh, proclaim his uh, righteousness to a people not yet born. And it's this, that the Lord has done this. That word, has done this, uh, in the Greek would be uh, tetelestai, which is, it is finished, the announcement from the cross, interestingly enough. In other words, the psalm ends with a very unusual word, um, uh, ends with a verb that matches up the completion of Christ's work on the cross. How about that? I think that's fascinating. So another reason to have children, because we need to have a people not yet born to proclaim God's deliverance to. To have you all here. Ah, the first, good. Judith's up. Judith's up there. Uh, okay. Andy Eckhart has a question. Ooh, it's a little big. Hey, look, I can see the whole thing. This is a miracle, folks. Can you please give a hypothetical example of how a family might faithfully allocate the Levitical tithe today? In doing so, please assume the following: that the family homeschools its children, and that its local church does not serve any educational function outside of the weekly sermon, that the family's local church is decidedly non-theonomic, but that there are no better churches in the area that allocates the money contributed to by its members in the typical ways of such churches. Today, the Pietistic Foreign Missions, Pastor's Salary, Local Pregnancy Center, etc. Okay, so under uh, a theonomic system, as uh, uh, taking Numbers 18, um, 36, and the passage in Nehemiah 10, 38, the tithe, the Levitical tithe, is to be tithed itself. The tithe goes to the Levites, the Levites take a tithe of that, and that goes to the priests. This is understood to be institutional worship gets a tithe of the tithe. The Levi Levites get 90% of it, but 10% goes to the institutional worship. Uh, and so under this situation, 10% uh, of your tithe would go to the local church you're fellowshipping at. That would be absolutely legitimate. Now the question then becomes what happens to the other 90%, which are for Levites, which would be for the education uh, of, in general of Israel, but also including your own children. Uh, one option that has been discussed uh, among theonomists who are working these questions out is that it would be legitimate to apply some of that Levitical money if you're doing homeschooling as opposed to spending money on a Christian school uh, to your own curricular expenses and things on that order. That could be potentially valid. Also, it involves uh, health considerations because Levites were not just responsible for education but also health. Uh, they would be monitoring things like mm, quarantines uh, and where those come into play and determinations when someone was healthy and could be taken out of quarantine, say, or if, if uh, leprosy had been healed. Um, this came into play even in Luke 10 with Christ and the healing of the uh, lepers. So uh, that's where we get the idea. And then, of course, it becomes interesting because then I would be potentially speaking in a self-serving way to say perhaps... Uh, Faithful parachurch ministries would be legitimate targets of, uh, or uh, goals or places where the tithe could be directed. There are those who say all of the tithe must go to the church, none of it must go to any parachurch ministries, and if it does, that is a misuse of stealing and robbing from God. Uh, and I do not, Dr. Stoney did not hold to that position. I do not hold to that position. Uh, I believe that you have to throw out the two texts that I said that actually talks about how the divide should be uh, numbered. And you see this war between books like the Covenantal Tithe by Dr. North and, say, the Tithing Dominion by um, Dr. Rush Tooney. Uh, what needs to be done, and it is under development, would be an analysis of both positions. Uh, scholars like Dr. Fugate, for example, could uh, partake in such a uh, um, convocation of scholars to work on this question. I would also like to participate in it because I have something to say, and I do speak a lot to the question of the three tithes and the poll tax. So uh, this is something that's going to be under discussion. Uh, 
um, because I think it's important that you realize that there are two streams of thought among modern theonomists, one headed by uh, Gary North and his approach, and then the other by Dr. Rashtuni and Powell. Uh, now, I think one needs to realize that Dr. North looked for his arguments, not his ad hominem attacks. You have to kind of filter out what he says. If he's simply going to say, well, Ed Powell, he's a no nobody and we never heard of him since, uh, but that is an odd way to deal with an argument that is made from scripture. So it's important to say, all right, I recognize Dr. North as a very skilled theologian, but I also realize that I need to uh, segregate his heat from the content. Because sometimes the content is, 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 is worth distilling it down and getting to that and looking past um, the subtle insults, some not so subtle insults that he sometimes brings to the table. Which means that, like John Bergen, as Warfield said of Bergen, he's incapable of writing a dull page. Uh, so you actually know where Dr. North stands, and that's a blessing in many respects. Where I agree with him, I think he does a fantastic job in one of the best books he's ever read, uh, written, uh, and I reviewed it positively, very positively, was Unconditional Surrender. And there are other books of his that uh, I would say I do not bring, uh, have so close to my heart, but that's okay, because we all see through a glass at this point darkly. Uh, but we're trying to move all in the same direction. At least we have uh, the same goal in mind, even if we are arriving at it from different routes. Okay. Hope that helps a little bit. Dave asks a third question. Are there basic, rem basic, basic remnants of Reconstruction? The recons I know are post-millennial, pre-sub-Calvinist. Are there others? I guess... Um, I'm not necessarily catching everything in this question. Um, oh, I guess maybe what are the tenets, perhaps? Um, re Reconstructionists, I do know Reconstructionists that are, in fact, not even uh, Calvinistic, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, but they, they exist. Yeah, it, it, uh, now, Dr. North, again, found this peculiar. He says, now, uh, I've insulted all these other people, and I probably even insulted post mill Arminians, if such there be, his words, not mine, because he said that seems, that's an odd combination, but I'm aware of one. So it doesn't mean that it can't be, can't exist. Um, some are not presuppositional, um, but I think if you treat Reconstruction as, say, I've heard different phrases for it, I call it seven or eight point Calvinism, and I've heard people say it's really 14 or 15 point Calvinism. At that point, think about this. <coughs> If you put all these distinctives in and all of them are required, then maybe you're the only one who fulfills all the bill because you're the unique, that unique combination and everyone agrees with you and all your 15 points. So it makes more sense for us to work with one shoulder using the, the, the uh, language used in uh, Zephaniah 3, I think it's 11th or 12th verse. Work with one shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder means with one shoulder um, for the purpose of God's kingdom. Remember, God has not given us doctrinal unity. He's given us an organic unity. The doctrinal unity is promised in the book of Isaiah, but it falls at the very end of time. In the meantime, we're to work by, uh, on our Christian character and dealing with people with, with whom with we disagree on certain points. But like Warfield said when he reviewed Strong's book on uh, a review of um, his systematic theology in regard to uh, baptism, he says, so we, dis we should acknowledge uh, or um, regard each other as uh, mistaken, but not thereby withdraw the right hand of fellowship, and by implication the right hand of working together, toiling together for the Lord, being fellow foot soldiers for God. So I think Reconstruction is first and foremost is willing to work with other Christians toward kingdom goals, uh, and everything else is oriented around that. You know, seek ye first the kingdom and its justice and righteousness, and then all the, the other things will be settled, including agreement on presuppositionalism, Calvinism, things like that. So. Uh, is the Christian Reconstructionist <laughs> supposed to hold to Austrian school economics? Uh, well, you can't hold to it all the way to the last line of Mon Mises because there's weaknesses there that have been exposed um, in, in theory of private property, for example. Uh, now, other libertarian scholars are looking at it, other Christians are looking at it, uh, but uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done. Remember, we are not at the tail end of history, as pre millennialists believe. We are in the primitive church, and this shows in many respects in the fact that we're having arguments and that we can have arguments in a very non-constructive way, a very divisive, destructive way. It ought not so to be, but because we are, constructionists tend to have very strong convictions, uh, this comes out in a way, and we become the strong in faith that Dr. Rashtuni says are actually quite weak uh, when it comes to what matters. Kim Helbrook, welcome. Question here. 
Uh, is it the role of the church to provide supplemental education to covenant children in Sunday school, given that the Bible states that the parents are to teach God's commands diligently to their children, thus being their primary teachers? A lot of this has to do with whether Sunday school was legitimate or not. If you go back to the Puritan era, uh, the children were in the same church services as the adults. There was not the age segregation that is present. This has now morphed into the, uh, the modern 21st century form of this, uh, where we uh, have family integrated church, right? Uh, and the question is, is, is that is that a, one, is that a hill to die on? And we've discussed it before. And second, what is the relationship to this point? Uh, I've always fear that a, um, a Sunday school teacher at a uh, church, if you decide you're going to split your family and move them over to that, uh, they may be great, they may not be. They may be undermining the faith of your children. Uh, and that is a sad reality that one must confront. It's important to realize that ultimate responsibility for the children's spiritual growth remains with the mother and the father. It is the responsibility cannot be delegated. The task can be delegated, but not the responsibility. Therefore, the, if you're going to do that, you are responsible to vet the content to what your children are doing. You must examine the lessons and, add it and then have the question back and forth. What did you learn today? Assuming you have your children in that situation. If your children are with you in church, then you're both suffering from the same mediocre sermon, potentially, or it might be a Reconstructionist church where you're getting the straight word of God, the whole counsel of God, and that they're really literally doing the whole counsel of God and not just doing what's fun for recons to talk about. Because Reconstructionists have their pet peeves and their, their pet topics, their pet sermons, their talking points. And it's not appropriate, I think, for the sermon from the pulpit to continue to lead uh, uh, for the pastor to just phone it in because he's talking about all the things he loves to talk about as opposed to dealing with the real-world problems that are actually his congregation is actually facing. Uh, or even saying, I want to avoid that thing because that might be a downer. You know, my church might need to hear about the downer thing and what God has to say about it. So we need to have more fortitude and faithfulness and courage on the part of pastors. <coughs> a lot of Reconstructionist pastors have that, but too many of them often fall into the trap of saying, I'm not going to teach sequentially through the, sermon, the Bible, I'm going to teach on my favorite topics. And I think that's a mistake. Unless, in fact, they have... Um, really intense application need in your congregation right then and there. It is appropriate, for example, if your congregation is out at a murder mill, uh, abortion mills, uh, for you to speak to that matter on a regular basis so that the, uh, the troops are aware of why they're there and it always gets kept in front of them why Christ calls them to that mission. That would be something where repetition would not harm anything. Let me see where we are time-wise. We have another 13 minutes. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Ground Control has thrown up a few things uh, that are useful for us. Oh, Charles Roberts. Welcome, Dr. Roberts. Let's see what we have to say. Uh, okay. Uh, Martin, we say a few words regarding reconstruction and the modern emphasis on social justice. I've had occasion to do that in these Q&As. I'm going to do it again today. The Bible knows nothing of social justice as that term is normally understood today. The Bible only knows about one kind of justice, individual justice. Individual justice is biblical justice. Now, individual justice can be distributed over a lot of individuals that have been harmed. Perhaps a group has been harmed, but there we still look for individual justice for each member of the group. That is what God's law requires. It is not group justice, it is individual justice at all points. There, and the second we creep over to the group situation, then people are then glommed into groups, and the groups are then put into contention against each other. Now, I've also pointed out, and there's a passage in Deuteronomy where we have the situation, Rashtuni speaks of it in his commentary on Deuteronomy, also in Institutes of Biblical Law. Uh, there's a murder between two towns. Who's responsible for that? The two towns then have to measure the distance. They actually literally, even if they know it's closer to one than the other, it's obviously, they will still measure the distance of the town, so they have it on record. And in the town that is closer to it, they will sacrifice the heifer and make up this offering to say that, you know, this is unatoned for blood, and we cannot have that. And therefore, they have community responsibility for it, but they do not uh, have um, an obligation to it from a justice point of view. In other words, they did not commit the murder, but God calls them to exhibit responsibility for it because it happened closer to their town than to any other town. And therefore, they therefore take the burden on their shoulders for that so that 
it is acknowledged that this does not go, in other words, people can't just walk away and say no. It's one of the primary problems with the Good Samaritan parable is that the people just walked around because uh, they're too busy being uh, good Christians to deal with the person who was injured and hurt. We see this today with the addiction crises and the other abuse uh, crises that are you know, sm uh, just smashing Christendom in its various forms. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, so just social justice, therefore, is not group justice, and in the scripture it's always individual justice. Uh, and I think that's an important point to play. That said, there are a lot of things where uh, Scripture deals with people like the poor, but it's, 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 they're not to be uh, depersonalized as a group. There are, that's why the, with the poor tithe in uh, Deuteronomy 14 is very personal. When the community comes together and gives the poor tithe to the poor, there's to be a face-to-face -face transaction that improves and solidifies community between the members of the community and the poor people that they're lifting up out of poverty in well and fell swoop. It's a major deal when the poor tithe actually eradicated poverty. And we've spoken about many times that Israel actually eradicated all poverty during the Maccabean era because they had to send the excess uh, poor tithe money to Jerusalem in its gold and silver, 600 talents of silver, 200 talents of gold, had to be stored there for the poor because they had no poor people to give it to, which was required. So the, the money may not remain with you, it must therefore go to the temple for the priest for the rainy day, say. So then it is reserved for relief of poverty. And they had that because they had no more poor people. That fulfilled the promise of Deuteronomy 15.4, you shall have no more poor among you, poor individuals among you, right? And so we had this poor widow who threw on the two mites. Mark Rishtuni spoke of this, I think, last week on his message, very touchingly. Uh, she gave all that she had. They gave out of their abundance, but she out of her substance, what was acquired for her, and she gave more than all the others combined. Why was she poor? Because in Mark 10, just a few verses before that, there was a rich young ruler who had defrauded the poor. Uh, that's the word used by Jesus. He thou shalt not defraud. Acabalipsis, uh, 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 I guess. Uh, aposteresis is the word, and that's the use word, uh, word used uh, for when you are defrauding, but in one of the uses, dominant uses, is to defraud the poor of their, their due, which is the poor tithe. What Isaiah calls grinding the face of the poor if you're not giving them the poor tithe. And Israel had fallen back into rejecting and not walking in this commandment. That's why Jesus says, one of these things you do lack. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor, give back to the poor. Uh, there was a fourfold penalty for that, and that's what constituted it. Unlike Zacchaeus, who came down and says, and eats Jesus, uh, he eats with, with Jesus <laughs> uh, in the house, and he says, all that I've defrauded anyone of, I'll restore fourfold. That was the requirement. And behold, salvation came to that house, but not to the rich and ruler who walked away because he was unwilling to sell what he had to pay what he owed the poor. So there are social obligations, but they are at the individual level eye to eye. They're community generating. If it is done through the vehicle of the state, then it is impersonal, it's institutional, and then it becomes an entitlement and there is no gratitude and there is no community. It, it becomes something that undermines community as a matter of fact. Okay, uh, what about the covenant guilt of nations that would be group and not individual justice? No. Now, that it becomes interesting because then when um, the uh, scribes and Pharisees uh, say, uh, his blood be upon us and upon our children, was that literally true? Or it was, was all of their their uh, the blood going to fall on them? No, because those who became Christians in that in their midst obviously would be exempt from that. But the nation was already condemned, and this was laid out in Matthew 21, the parable of the uh, wicked husbandmen. Right, uh, the owner of the vineyard gives it to them to control, be stewards over. He goes to a far country. Then he starts sending messengers to collect, but they abuse one and they beat out the other and throw the other one out. And then he says, well, they will respect my son. So he sends his son. And they say, well, there comes the heir. Let's kill him and we'll gain the inheritance. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So, and then Jesus asks, as the parable concludes, so what is the owner of the vineyard going to do when he finds out what they did? And the Pharisees condemn themselves out of their own mouths. He said, well, he will uh, utterly destroy those um, wicked husband men and lend out the uh, vineyard to people who will give him the fruits thereof. See? And that's what they did. The reason for the destruction of the, their being cast out of the vineyard, Israel's destruction, was the murder of their own Messiah. God tolerated an awful lot of things from them, and they still were able to survive covenantally. But the murder of their Messiah was the thing that would get them cut off. It actually is, the, from one point of view, the abomination, the height of abomination, the wing of abominations is how it reads in Daniel 9. 
upon the summit of abomination, or upon the wing of abomination, the highest point of abomination, cometh destroyer, right? And so this is the way the Hebrew reads in the literal, as Hengstenberg renders it. So there's the killing of the son, and his cutting off, as is mentioned in Daniel 9, uh, and has nothing because he's been murdered. He says that is the event which triggers the, uh, and that is the height, the wing of abomination that triggers the destruction and cometh to destroy it. Comes the destroyer, uh, and then desolations are decreed. Christ had dis they decreed those desolations, uh, laid out in Matthew twenty three twenty four. So, now I'll also talk about um, the law of nations. The law of nations is an idea that came into play under the influence of Grotius and Puffendorf, and so their texts are still available. And a lot of people have tried to develop these texts and say this early Christian notion. Uh, is really what we need to have bring back to play and Theonomus should adopt it. I am not convinced that Theonomus should adopt it. I'm convinced it has all sorts of problems, had problems back then, and it has problems today. Um, and it does not reflect, I think, properly the, uh, the, the way that where nations actually stand before God. Uh, it would justify things like the United Nations or the League of Nations, which I think do not uh, have the kind of justification that are required for them to one, extract money from us, <laughs> and things like this, like that. So, uh, but it has a history, and people have adopted it, and then they assume that the um, International Court at The Hague is some kind of authority on biblical justice, which, of course, it is not. Uh, and uh, it's just a matter of the sovereignty simply being centralized higher and higher. It's used as an excuse or a pretext for that. So we had to be aware that the idea of a law of nations was premised actually on more classical thinking that got imported without too much thought into uh, Christendom through the work of Grotius, Puffendorf, and subsequent scholars. Uh, now, it does have a large body, and that's where some um, uh, concepts of just warfare, um, the just war theory came from out of the notion of law of nations. But you see violations of this concept in because uh, uh, it puts to rest rather badly in the Book of Lamentations, you know, Josiah kind of was operating in terms of law and nations, and it didn't work for him because God didn't operate in terms of that concept when he said, I'm going to intercept Pharaoh uh, Nico uh, as he's trying to move, march to Carchemish because he's operating and I want to have a preemptive war to stop it, and that didn't work. So a lot of things have to uh, come into play before we uh, resuscitate the idea of the law of nations. Now everyone talks about it because everyone wants to have all these nations at peace with one another, but there is no pre say the Lord to the wicked, and peace comes from the nations turning to Christ. And so trying to get there humanistically is always going to be by coercive force. Uh, and that's where the rub is. They're willing to say, well, for the sake of peace, would you not give up this, that, and the other? And soon you give up everything, including your soul. Uh, and it doesn't work. You still won't have peace because there is no peace under that circumstance. True pe Christ is the Prince of Peace. And he causes peace to expand. For the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Notice, the two things correlate. The increase of his government and peace, which comes only with his government, shall increase without end until it covers the world. So that's the mission. Three more minutes. Oh, when charity ceases, statism flourishes. That's so true, Roberto. All right, remember, tomorrow, Book of the Month Club. If you haven't signed up to uh, hear what Chris Zimmerman and Andrea Schwartz have to say about uh, um, the American system, the nature of the American system, sign up for it now. Uh, if the link isn't up, I'm sure Ground Control will put it up. Do pray for Chalcedon, and we appreciate your support. We're able to do what we can because you support what we do. And uh, for that, we're very, very grateful. We're trying to be faithful to the Word. We also have to acknowledge our limitations. We realize that we are in the primitive church, and what we're doing is trying to direct the growth of the church in positive ways. Appreciate all the thanks, and uh, I see so many good close friends here. Again, let us work together with one shoulder for the sake of God's kingdom. There's the registration for the Book of the Month Club. We will see you all next week. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meat of the Word Q&A with Martin Selbredi. We pray that you have been edified by the content that you've heard on this episode. Please visit calcedon.edu for some great resources and reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you in all that you do.